Welcome to Inside the Women of Denver, where we talk to local leaders about their successes, failures, and lessons learned on the journey to success. I'm Crystal Covington, and today I'm here with Tina Ebert, a certified relationship coach, holistic psychotherapist, licensed marriage and family therapist, and addictions counselor. She's the best-selling author of Stop Fighting, Start Loving, Five Proven Ways to Ignite a Lifetime of Love. Tina, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. Yes. So you have done a lot of really incredible things. You have a lot of credentials. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to get into the industry you're in. I mean, you're in the industry of love and of health and of helping people to live their best lives. Yeah, and love is complicated. It can be, so I try to make it simple. So I think it really all started growing up. Um, I grew up during the height of the women's liberation movement in America's heartland, which is Ohio. Yep. I'm from Michigan. We're neighbors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I grew up, there was a misogynistic undercurrent that ran through the generations of my family. Mm -hmm. And divorces occurred really like dominoes in the 1980s mm -hmm. when I grew up. And it fueled a lot of anger and a lot of division between the men and the women. So this is really, I think, what ignited my desire to do something different for my future. And, you know, I learned really hard lessons at a really young age from the messages I took in from my family about not being valued as a woman being weak, incompetent, and inferior to men. So there's an example I like to tell about, you know, my mom, she'd be scurrying around in the kitchen trying to get dinner on the table, mm -hmm. just in time for my dad to get home after long days at work, or a time when um, we would go on a family road trip to Florida to visit my grandparents, and my dad would drive the entire way, and that's pretty far from Ohio, yeah. uh, because he didn't feel my mom was a competent driver. So my family was the same. Yeah, my dad drove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was constantly being, you know, observing really that women were being told to play small or to be outright silent altogether. Mm -hmm. And so I've been really um, inspired to help empower women in their relationships, particularly to really step in and be more of who they are and not be too um, overpowering and demanding in their masculine, but also not to be submissive and subordinate in their feminine. So now you hit me right there. I have not figured out what the differences are between masculine and feminine. So can you tell us a little bit about what that means? What does it mean to be in your masculine or to be in your feminine? Mm -hmm. Sure, so when I think about women, especially like successful, um, driven women or high achieving women like yourself or me or many people may be watching, um, you know, we feel really compelled to have it all, like we want to really be superwoman in our career and at homes. Yes. And this can impact our ability to really feel fulfilled in our love life. And the reason is because all that drive, all that pushing really leads us to be in our masculine. And so I feel that we must learn to get out of the trap of privileging our masculine. Uh -huh. And when I say masculine, what I mean is feeling like we have to make all the decisions, okay. like from uh, dinner to um, child care to vacations to our financials and it's really a lot so yeah. even though that drives results in business it fuels anger and resentment in our love life and here's why it's because when we're in our masculine it doesn't allow men to be in theirs so balance creating that balance within the relationship of the kind of the different energies, balancing those energies. Yeah, I feel like it's important for women to be able to integrate their masculine and their feminine. And I think that a lot of times we're too much in our masculine mm -hmm. and maybe that drives results in our business and gets stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, but it doesn't work in our love life. It actually can repel love. And so when I think of feminine, for me, I think of um, things like, um, nurturing, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, I think when in relationships I help women, what is your vision for your relationship? Mm -hmm. um, empowerment, um, can you learn to receive? Do you value That's yourself? So uh, courage, authenticity, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. Nice, okay. So what do you do when you have two people in a relationship and they're struggling to keep those energies and that balance together. What are some of the suggestions that you have that help them to work better together? Or you know, if I don't know if you lead people to marriage or if your if your goal is that, but it, 
kind of how do you help them to restructure and rebuild so that they're in balance and they're they're really working together well. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting uh, to me is that whether a woman is married, dating, or single, the women that come and talk with me who are really struggling in their love life um, and they don't feel happy and they don't feel fulfilled and they've had a lot of pain um, is they really need to learn how to find themselves. So when they say, how do I um, find fulfillment in my love life? I say, well, first you need to find yourself. And what I mean by that is um, a process of um, kind of gathering all of the pieces of yourself that they lost in past relationships from an attempt to contort themselves to try to be someone that they weren't, yeah. right? So it's really a process of reclaiming all of who you are. And women really feel, I feel like they need to value themselves. And that, whether so whether they're single, whether they're dating or whether they're married, um, if they're struggling, it always comes back to finding themselves again. Yeah. Who is it that they want to be? How do they want to feel in a relationship? Ooh, that's a big one. Right? Because it's not so much about the partner. It's like if you know who you want to be in a relationship, yeah. then you get to attract a partner who can support the best version of you. Or you can help communicate that if you are in a relationship to your yeah. partner. I like that. I love the fact that you talked about having a vision. And I feel like vision in any parts of our lives, that's really something that people struggle to, to do. We go through things and we say, oh, I want that. You know, I want those shoes, so I'm going to work towards getting this pair of shoes. Or I want that job, so I'm going to work towards that job. But in the end, what's, what's your true vision of what you want to be or how you want to feel? You mentioned that. And that's something that I just discovered that that was even a thing I should want because of a book that I read um, <laughs> that I should even, I didn't know, how do I want to feel? That was something I hadn't asked myself. But um, how do people go and create that vision? What is the first step to even acknowledging who you want to be or how you want to feel? Yeah, I often help women really get in touch with their feminine strength and confidence. And the first thing is identifying what is it that you really want and how do you really want to feel? And that's really having a, d a deep conversation and exploring it. And it's so funny because um, a lot of women have lists, right? I mean, they, they know what they want, they think. So it kind of sounds ridiculous. You know, they might have a list of like, well, I want a guy who's six foot, feet tall and uh, is physically fit and has no uh, tattoos or piercings and he likes dogs and doesn't like cats or whatever the heck it is. I had those. Yeah. <laughs> But when I ask somebody, like, how do you really want to feel, then they suddenly realize that that list doesn't matter so much, yeah. right? So it's really a, a, um, a process of self-discovery mm -hmm. to determine that. Uh, that's super, super important. And the other thing is, I think, really letting go of any limiting beliefs, habits, stories that we carry around. And that's really driven by fear, because fear can really um, fuel unconscious sabotaging behaviors right, and take us out of the present moment. Mm -hmm. And so that can often get in our way of feeling fulfilled in our love life. And I kind of forgot the question you had, but. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I was going You on. actually made me think about my own life. And I remember, well, my husband bring this up, brings this up a lot. When, whenever we have a deep discussion, he always brings back, goes back to what I said I wanted in the beginning. And it's really powerful whenever he brings it up. And he said, well, Crystal, you said in the beginning you wanted to be seen and you wanted someone to love you for who you are. And he remembered that because that was the one thing. I, I had all these lists of things that I wanted. He needed to be smart, he needed to be tall, you know, much taller than me in my highest of high heels and all these, <laughs> all these little silly things. But then the thing that really mattered the most was that. And every time he brings it up to me, I feel a calming effect. Yeah, that is what I want and I still want that. And that's what I, I mean, I value it so much. I try to do it for other people. I try to help other people be seen because that's what I want most for myself. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah we were talking earlier about, I, I had a conversation with a woman just yesterday and she was telling me about a product. Like, I will never recommend a product unless I've used it already, mm -hmm. right? And I related that to herself because she was someone that really didn't value herself. She had no idea how she wanted to feel. Mm -hmm she wasn't connected to her vision. It was more this idea of, and a lot of women, I think they get this idea of they want this Prince Charming and they want to feel secure and they want to feel protected, but they have no idea really how to create that. Yes. 
right? So um, I don't know, remember how exactly I said it to her, but it's like she needs to, we need to value ourselves so much that we, we, we show up for ourselves. Like, I'm good enough. I'm going to like offer myself to you. Yes. Right? And I love that you, it sounds like you may have done that with your husband. Yeah, I guess I did without knowing it. I wasn't that smart back then. I was just... <laughs> you did it naturally. Yeah, it just happened that way. <laughs> I wish it was by intention, but we all have to learn. Yeah, yeah. so what is the big lesson that you want to make sure everybody gets from your story, the journey that you've been on, and all the things that you've studied? I mean, you have so many credentials. You've studied a ton. So what are some of the biggest lessons that you want people to take away? Yeah, I think if it's okay, I'd like to share a, a story. Um, let's see if I can remember it really clearly. But I, I may have mentioned to you that in a conversation we've had previously that I spent a decade in Alaska. Yes, you did. And <laughs> that's not really the story I want to tell, but it's important in that that was a time when I was really in my masculine. I was a fish biologist. Um, in a very male-dominated field. I had to learn how to run chainsaws, build buildings, catch fish, shoot guns, like all this crazy stuff. And um, I had no idea that I was really living that way. I mean, it was kind of the way there. Yeah. Um, but the story that I want to tell is that in Colorado, we know that there are mountains to climb, mm -hmm. if you choose to. And it was about, I think, eight years ago, I uh, volunteered for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society by riding my road bike 100 miles Whoa. in the mountains. And, you know, actually it was in the high desert of Utah. It was in Moab. Oh and my gosh, yeah. yeah, and so um, this challenge really forced me to take, at the time, my sad self and my really rock bottom situation and put it in perspective because there was people literally, literally fighting for their lives. And I also, too, felt I was fighting, but I felt I had more privilege, I had more choice. So I could choose to pick myself up and keep on living as opposed to letting myself really die from a broken heart. So uh, training to ride a century ride really taught me that sprinting would not get me to the finish line yeah. and I couldn't avoid the physical pain of the training. And a century ride is really, it is an endurance ride because you know, you're climbing to over 10,000 feet and you have to be really bold and you have to be really determined to get to the finish line because you're going to be in the saddle oh for like gosh. six hours or more. So the reason I'm telling you this is because for several more years I trained to ride century rides or endurance rides and it was really to prove to myself that I could do anything if I put my mind to it and it wasn't the physical pain that I was afraid of or feared. It was really the emotional pain and the negative self-talk that I really wanted to conquer. And so my way of doing that was to ride my bike for hundreds of miles up steep wow. mountain roads as my solution to healing my emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And wow. it was the emotional pain uh, that I carried from feeling deeply betrayed and deeply rejected from a series of events um, that led to the broken engagement from my fiance at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was all this anger that really fueled me and like drove me to the top of the mountain. That like, was some serious fuel. Yeah, like, <laughs> like 14,000 feet. I think I remember riding through like wow. rain, sleet, and snow. And I would just keep riding. And what was interesting is my anger turned to laughter. I remember tears and then like this really calm shelter from really the storm, I say, that was going on in my mind. Yeah. And it didn't heal my broken heart. It didn't heal the emotional pain that I carried. But it was the beginning of not acknowledging that you know, I, it was finally like my chance to break through from or break free from a partner who is not deserving of me yeah. and also all the unconscious patterns and the habits that kept me in a series of relationships over the years that were unhealthy, right? So it was really um, my desire to be in a romantic relationship that really allowed me to actually choose an institution over my own personal well-being. Wow. Yeah, and so, you know, I call it like my, my um, like the grand finale, like no more encore. You know, I was going to, I lived through this and I felt like I was like the perfect champion for women to help them if they were in similar um, relationship problems, like if they had similar issues with being in an abusive relationship or unhealthy relationships, because it was really my opportunity and my responsibility yeah. to make sure that they didn't have to go through what I went through. Wow, I was blown away with that story. <laughs> that was so powerful. Gosh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome.
Well, um, I hope everybody's <laughs> as blown away as I am. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for everything that you just shared and for um, for that story. Is there anything else you want to leave everybody with? Just believe in yourself. Keep going. Life can be an endurance ride. It's not a sprint to the finish, right? Value yourself. Beautiful. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. Thank you. And thanks for joining us on Inside the Women of Denver. Always remember that you deserve to be seen, heard, and known. I'll see you soon.